Okay, I think in, in really basic term, blockchain is just a distributed ledger. Think of it as as a ledger. Uh, I think the key components there is it is distributed, it is decentralized, and it is immutable. What do I mean? Um, distributed means that it runs over a network of computers and because there's no central authority, I, I think I always give an example. If you compare the fiat currency that that we use, fiat currency, of course, is issued by central central banks, and uh, it's a store of value. But you know, if if you have an item, you're a seller, I'm a buyer. If I give you fiat, you give me the item. We, the reason we do that is we have trust in the government, in the central bank, and the government that. You know, this note that I'm giving you is of this value. But with blockchain, it is distributed um, and it's decentralized. There is no central authority. And it's also immutable. What does that mean? Remember, I told you it is a ledger. A ledger is just where you record transactions. Okay? I'll give you an example. A basic example is an, ex an example of an Excel sheet. Mm where if people are recording different transactions, because there's a debit, there's a credit. Now, of course, that is prone to alteration. Someone can alter the transaction at one point. But with blockchain, when we say it is immutable, it means once a transaction has been verified by a network of computers and completed, it forms a block. That block is appended at the end of a chain. That's why it's called a blockchain. Once that block has been appended at the block of that chain, no one can alter it. So it's immutable. So in a nutshell, it's a, it's a ledger. Cut it as a ledger, distributed, decentralized, and immutable or unalterable. No one can change it after it has been completed. Well, if if you look at the the problem that we currently face in Uganda, for example, we have an issue around financial inclusion. Very many people um, have no access uh, to banking services. We have what we call the, the unbanked and the underbanked. Now, um, the underbanked, usually we forget about them. You know, with the, with the coming of the fintechs, the telcos, the mobile money, very many people, for example, have accounts or wallets with, the, with these fintechs. But they are usually it's just a conduit. Someone receives money, then they cash it out. They receive money, they cash it out. That is not someone who is the money economy. Financial inclusion should really look at an, a whole end-to-end -end picture that how does money stay within the ecosystem? What other services between, uh, can be used by these, the, by these people or customers besides just cashing out? Now, very many people are underbanked or unbanked. Now, with blockchain, and there are very many reasons why, for example, there is, we, we have many people who are, not, who are not financially included. I think one of the key reasons is the exorbitant fees um, in payments or remittances. If someone wants to, for example, send money from, uh, say, the Middle East uh, to Uganda, a small man, like 50,000 shillings, because we have middlemen, we have intermediaries, the middlemen have there's a top up they make on that transaction. So in some instances, it goes up to 35% cost. So someone is sending money and then you cut off 35% of that transaction. Then the person at the tail end or the last mile customer is going to get much less money. The costs are very, very exorbitant. They are prohibitive, so to say. Now remember I, told, I said that blockchain is decentralized. What that means, you are eliminating middlemen, all those intermediaries. So the person, if I want to send 50,000 to someone in a village, because I'm reducing the number of intermediaries or third parties, that means the person is going to get a higher value. Yeah, so high, high cost is a very, very uh, key factor in, uh, in excluding people financially that's number one but also there are very many requirements if if someone wants to open up a bank account for example um, and I'm not talking about just individuals even corporate entities you can look at both retail and, and 
and the enterprise, the, the KYC requirements can be quite, you know, uh, it's very difficult for very many people. You will go here and they ask you for, for details. I'll give you an example. If you want to open a bank account, um, they'll ask you for very many things. And then imagine you're using blockchain. Blockchain is a, is a, can be a public domain or a private domain. Now, I'll give you an example. If the Uganda Bankers Association had a blockchain use case for KYC, which means me as Francis, um, I submit my KYC, that KYC is captured on that blockchain. Another person submits their KYC, it's captured on that blockchain. So if Francis is to open up an account in Bank A, they'll simply refer to the blockchain. They go to Post Bank. Post Bank will not again, if I go to Post Bank, Post Bank will not again ask for more KYC because they already have access to KYC. So what that does for you in, in, in KYC uh, harmonization is that you have a pool of resources. You have KYC for all the banked people. So I don't have to go to bank A, they ask me for KYC. If I, I go to bank B, they ask me for the same KYC, yeah. bank C. No, simply integrate into a blockchain. The blockchain has immutable. Remember I talked about immutable. No one can alter my KYC. If Nira has issued this national ID, it's a legitimate national ID. This national ID is on this blockchain. No one can order it. It is legitimate. So whichever bank you go to, they always refer to that KYC. So KYC requirements is also very another important factor. The third is around credit. Majority of people open up accounts to get credit, credit facilities from banks. Now, getting a credit facility can be quite uh, a difficult process because they're going to ask you for you know collateral. How sure are we that you're going to you'll be able to pay these transactions? And we, we must be alive to the fact that a lot of our transactions in Uganda, they informal transactions. You'll find a person, they've been sending money uh, via mobile money, doing quite a number of transactions via mobile money. But are you going to go to a bank and say, guys, I need a, a loan based on my mobile money transaction? No bank is going to give you that loan. What blockchain does? For you under credit is because we are keeping a record of transactions in wherever whatever channel you use whether it's a fintech for mobile money whether it's a banking uh, environment we have a record of those transactions because we have a record of those transactions i can ably verify that what is the credit worthiness of this customer even if they, they were sort of informal transactions. You know, someone sending 50,000 shillings here and there, and they have come for a loan of 500,000. I can ably verify that this person is credit worthy based on this ledger of all these transactions that are verifiable on a chain. So I think credit is a very important use case that, that will also be very important financially include our people and very many other use cases. But Blockchain can be integrated with any sort of technology. There are use cases, for example, in Ghana and in Rwanda, where people use even over USSD. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that a person must have, for example, a sophisticated smartphone, even a basic phone or a feature phone that can access USSD, can be able to integrate with blockchain. It's really about integration. But I must also, I think, mention one thing. Um, we work under a regulated environment, so compliance is very key. Now, I, I happen to be part of the, the Uganda Bankers Association Committee. Uh, I represented Uganda Bankers Association. In the, there's a blockchain committee that was formed by Bank of Uganda. The purpose of that committee really was to uh, benchmark, look at the use cases that can you know, be used for blockchain in Uganda, come up with a report, and then that report can be used as a benchmark for policy formulation and law, of course, coming up with the compliance framework. Now, as of today, um, blockchain and, uh, for example, crypto, those are things that are not, not regulated by Bank of Uganda, but we are in advanced stages. I must say, there are advanced stages. Bank of Uganda 
has taken it up. That's why we, it was an all-inclusive team from banks, from telcos, from, from fintechs. We came together, we came up with that report, use cases. So I think there's a policy formulation. So right now, um, there are use cases that can be implemented very easily. But we must get a go-ahead from, from the Bank of Uganda. So from an integration perspective, it is very easy. Uh, we have invested in the technology, we, have, we are building capacity. Mm. So once we get a green light, mm. and I know across the industry, that is the case. Mm. Once a green light is given by the... I know that right now Bank of Uganda is also regulating the fintechs. Previously, of course, it was UCC, but right now it's Bank of Uganda. Mm. Once the green light is gotten, it's about integration. If I talked about the use case of remittances, for example, yes, yes. Um, Really, it's about getting to integrate with a, a, a service provider, for example, in, mm. in Dubai or Oman or Canada, yeah. whatever corridor it is, for example, directly to our Wendy. I don't know if you've heard of Wendy, our Wendy platform. And then via USSD or the app, it's the same, really. You, ca you can access blockchain on whatever channel. Mm -hmm. So the integration is the least complex bit. It is the compliance really that that takes time. Mm -hmm. And I think from a compliance perspective, it is important to know that uh, we must have a sandbox. A sandbox is like a test environment where people play around, implement a few things, a few use cases, and then you show the regulator that, okay, from our sandbox, this is what we see. This is how we intend to, to use this use case. And then the regulator can give you a guide. But of course, it all depends on how soon we can get the go-ahead from the regulator. Blockchain is here to stay. Blockchain really is here to stay. Um, and I think they realized that that's why they set up, they deliberately set up a committee uh, to look into the blockchain usage. But of course, like I've, I've explained, they know, Bank of Uganda knows the benefits. Uh, they appreciate the benefit of blockchain will come. But of course, as a regulator, there are concerns. Okay, um, consumer protection, for example, we, we all know we are, we are aware of um, the scams that have happened, in, including Uganda. Scams around crypto. I think there was some cryptocurrency called one coin, they came and really scammed a lot of people. Remember, the, the decentralized nature of blockchain also creates a problem um, because at the end of the day. That means anyone can really do anything they want. There's no central authority, okay? That's why we need to find a way, you strike a balance. How do, I, how do I get the benefits blockchain has to offer while at the same time protecting the consumer? It is, it is, it's a very important, it's a delicate balance, but it's very important because at the end of the day, we must maintain the, the integrity and the fidelity of, of, of the consumers out there. Uh, so the decentralized nature of blockchain a very big problem i think that's why the regulator sometimes is, is a bit slow that at the end of the day the people look up to the regulator to protect them they're the consumer so yeah that's why it's a bit has to be it has to be in a phased approach they must uh, you know cross all the t's and dot all the i's because you don't want a situation where you opened up and then people are being scammed left, right, and center. And, and also, literacy is very important. People have to be educated on on, on these blockchain use cases. That's it's important. I think that's why they have taken time, but at least they are moving in the right direction. The limitations are right now, the banking has to, to depend on third parties heavily. You have to depend on third parties. Third parties. But of course, once you depend on third parties for, for remittances or payments, for example, the third party also has to make money. They are going to add something on top of that. At the end of the day, it is a, the final consumer who is going to incur that cost. So it is, it is very exorbitant. Mm -hmm. So in as much as, if you look at the agenda that has been taken, previously there was no mobile money, mobile money came along, but still the, the financial inclusion is a very big problem. You ask yourself why it is really cost. If do the cost of withdrawing mobile money is quite can be, it's quite expensive. It's quite it's a very expensive. 
Uh, okay, I think Wendy has, has done much better than the rest of the competitors, but still, uh, there's room for, for improvement because we also don't operate in isolation, we integrate with. So t the cost is what makes it very exorbitant. So, and also accessibility, you know, uh, not very many people have access to uh, to banks. Uh, banks, of course, uh, they, it can't be, it can't be, make financial sense for the bank to be present in every location. So accessibility is a problem. I think blockchain solves that problem for, for the reasons that I've already talked about, including KYC, ETC. Yeah. There are, there are a number of lessons that have been learned. Of course, like I said, it's ever evolving. Now, um, of course, cryptocurrency is just an element that runs on one of so an element that runs on blockchain. And I think whereas many entities in the world, many governments in the world don't really uh, advocate for crypto, but for example, there are those that are looking at introducing a central bank digital currency sort of setup. So you have a, a central bank with the, the digital currency, so which is going to run on a blockchain. You eliminate the issue around the, the, the issues that come with decentralization and lack of authority, but then you sort of use the advantages, you derive the benefits that blockchain does. They've created what they call stable coins, eh? for example. Um, what they do, there's what they call for USDT. USDT is one of the stable coins. They say USDT is pegged to a US dollar. So what they do, uh, that one USDT is equal to one US dollar. But a challenge with that, remember these are these are coins or tokens that are, are generated. Someone can increase the supply. Now once you increase the supply, you, you cannot keep that, that currency stable because I think that's what, what keeps really the, for example, the shilling stable is how much of the shilling is out there in supply. And that's, that is centralized. But with the with the with the with the digital currency, it is becomes very because someone can can decide to allocate more tokens or more coins into the ecosystem, and then the thing just collapses. So, yeah, you are right. It's not necessarily a store of value, but there are some use cases. There's a company called MicroStrategy in uh, in the US. What they do, they buy bitcoins, and then they offer them as it's a derivative. So you bought. I bought maybe 10,000 Bitcoin worth maybe 500 million US dollars. And then this, this company is issuing out a shares to the public. Mm -hmm. So the public is buying shares in the company, but the company is buying Bitcoin. So it's some sort of it's a complex arrangement. I'm not necessarily buying the, the, the crypto, yeah. I'm buying shares in a company, but the company is paid to to Bitcoin. So, and of course there are a couple of other financial derivatives that have been done around around crypto, but yeah, ultimately it's a very, very volatile venture. Yeah. If I'm a person down there in the, in the village, I want to be in the part of the money economy. And being part of the money economy means I have a wallet account or a bank account not just for purposes of withdrawing, but there are some other, we we'll call them advanced services. Can I get insurance? Can I get credit? Can I get what other sort of advanced services within the ecosystem? The biggest problem we have right now is people use bank accounts just as conduits, and even mobile money owners, conduits. Someone just receiving money, they go to an agent, withdraw, and they take the cash, the market to buy but how do we keep the money within the ecosystem without cashing out because remember the objective is being cashless mm. so i think it would fundamentally change the landscape uh, from being a cash based to a cashless economy it doesn't matter where where you where where you go if i want to go to a supermarket to buy something i, I don't need to cash out if i want to go to the salon for a haircut, I go to the hospital. Right now, in as much as we have mobile money, but still, the largest number of transactions of mobile money is a cash out. Mm. 
the cash out transaction type is the largest, <laughs> which means people just get money, go withdraw. Get money, go withdraw. So the very many requirements someone needs to be onboarded. Um, the way I look at it, if for example someone is living A6, hmm, they are in A6 vacation. Ordinary that person, what do you expect them to do? They would get a basic phone, okay? S6, I think they should have a national ID because they're above it. They should have a national ID. They should have a basic phone. Immediately, that person should be onboarded in the money economy. But right now, okay, from S6, then they go to university. Maybe they will need um, credit to, after university, they will need credit to buy a piece of land or to buy a small car. But this person, all this entire lifespan while they're at university for three years, they've been doing transactions on mobile money, for example. Informally, they've been doing transactions. After university, that person will go to a bank to get a piece of, a, a loan to buy a small car or to buy a small piece of land. That loan request will be rejected. They will say yes. there's no credit history. I think this person has been transacting <laughs> from vacation up to campus, after campus, for three years. They've been transacting. Just because I've not been transacting formally in a bank, does not mean I'm credit worthy. I think that's a very big problem. You start from zero. I you? start from zero, effectively. You have been receiving I've been receiving money. money, I've been all those. So, but if I have a record of data that these are in my lifetime, in the past five years, I've been doing this transaction. Really, at least I should afford a loan of one million shillings. So I think for me, that's a it's a very, very big problem. And then, of course, other over the top service I talked about. Um, I, I know very many Ugandans. Insurance is not one of the things that Ugandans like. <laughs> it's one of those, those services that people really. But what data gives you? The data can give you some sort of assurance that um, if. Um, to, to buy a bouquet or a package from this insurance company, the what we call InsureTech, from this insurance company. And does it have to be one lump sum amount? Maybe it can be daily transactions or weekly transactions, monthly transactions. And then at some point, maybe a person gets an accident or they get sick. That money from, from the insurance can be very helpful. But how do you convince someone uh, to get insurance? It's, it's, very, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. But with this transaction history and all those things, I think customer value, there's what we call customer value segmentation. That how do I tailor a product to a person that needs it? Um, going back to that example I've given you, within five years, I've been doing transactions that banks do not know about because I've been using mobile money. <laughs> banks don't know about the transactions. And then at some point, I'm going to go to a bank to get a loan or to buy insurance or to get anything. What the, the bank would do, because I have access to data, that this person, I know that this person within five years, they'll be out of campus, they'll maybe be having their first job. A bank should be able to proactively tell you that, hey, Francis, do you know that we have customized loans for, for, for land, for example? Three years later, they should be able to tell me, Francis, you know that we have customers' loans for, for weddings. Because if you look at the entire life cycle of a person, a person goes out of school, they go to university, they, maybe they buy a piece of, piece of land, they buy a car, they marry or get married. But how are banks leveraging on that information? Can I be able to predict that within seven years from now, Francis will need a loan for a wedding. Blockchain is going to give you that because I have transactions, banks have access to these transactions. They know that this person of this identity, within 10 years, you will need this loan. I'll customize the product for you. I'll, I'll no, pitch you, you'll get it. Yes. No, <laughs> so, <laughs> the protocol of Bitcoin, of course, is called, I don't want to be very technical, it's called proof of work, it required a lot of electricity, a lot of compute power. Yeah. Along the way, more protocols were developed, like proof of stake, which make it very easy. Even a person with a PC, me alone with my laptop, 
uh, not called validator. I can be part of the network that validates a blockchain transaction. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, just like the internet, when people internet was coming up and were saying, yeah, this thing, mm -hmm. thing is not going to work, I can, I can let you know that blockchain within five years, it is here to stay. Very many use cases are going to be built on it. So the, the earlier we get on it, the better. I think everyone really um, deserves to be financially included. Now, um, I think as Post Bank, of course, one of our purposes is to foster prosperity for, for, for Ugandans. If I'm not financially included, how am I going to stimulate entrepreneurship, for example? How am I? We, we, we must um, create value. The biggest problem we face in, 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 in Uganda or in Africa is being consumers. We are not creators. How do I create value if I'm not financially included? How do I become an entrepreneur? And that's a tough, big, compl complex project, for example. Someone can be as good as someone has, maybe there are two hands or three hands in the village. It is, it is a project. It's something that can give them value. And uh, of course, you know our people are quite, um, with capitalism, what capitalism does, it creates, there's a very big gap between the haves and the have-nots. Now, how do we bridge that gap? It's, it's a lack of knowledge. If someone has never accessed a bank account, they don't even know how, how to open a bank account. People are going to buy things very cheaply from them and sell them very exorbitantly to others. If you are using blockchain, for example, I'm connecting the deepest seller in the village to a buyer in town. Remember, the, the idea around eliminating middlemen is very key in blockchain. It's very principal. But the people here in the middle are the problem. Now, there's a person out there in the village, they have maybe they have their coffee or their, their matoke or their, their hens. Someone comes from town, buy them very cheaply. Then they come here, do nothing. Not even, there is no value addition in Uganda. Um, there are very many areas that don't have access to. They are off the grid, really. Don't have access to, to the internet. You go there, there's no network. So it's very important. And I think it has to be a public-private sort of partnership. Uh, the government has to partner with uh, these uh, pub uh, private entities for example, and ensure that connectivity in Uganda is improved. Because at the end of the day, it's a network. So you can have very good technology, but if there's no connectivity, it's a problem. Uh, you talked about, and connectivity comes in many, many ways. It can be, for example, fiber, it can be access to, uh, to USSD, USSD codes, it can be access to, to the app, data, that means, for example, telcos have to invest heavily in ensuring that uh, you know sites, their sites reach across across board, not just concentrate within the CBDO and metropolitan area, even in the deepest areas. Because remember, I told you that with blockchain, even you can use a USSD. But if there's no network, then there's a problem. Now, in terms of, um, of course, from from an impl implementation perspective, you need data centers. You need data centers that can really power uh, the blockchain. Blockchain can be, you can implement blockchain in the cloud, but of course the cloud requires good connectivity. So we need a lot of support our people internally. That means within Uganda, people have to invest in, in data centers, tier three, it can even be a tier two data center. Uh, you mentioned Roxio. I know there are other entities that have, that have data centers that do coll collocation services, it is very important. Electricity, of course, is very key because at the end of the day, if a telco is to establish a site in a remote area, that site requires electricity because fuel is very expensive, I can tell you. One of the biggest uh, cost drivers for, for telcos is, is, is fewer where there's no electricity. So electricity is also very important. So, and you, because you see, these are now big projects. These are big, big things that private entities alone can do, even the government alone can do. So it has to be a partnership between the government, 
and private entities. How do we come together to ensure that there's nobody who is off grid from an electricity perspective? How do we ensure that I don't go in an area where they tell you you have first climbed a tree to get access to bars? To bars. <laughs> so it's, uh, but I think the, it has been, the government is intentional on that. Um, if you look at also the cost of the internet, I think, for, for example, NITA recently slashed down the cost of the of the internet by Mbps. Because the cost can also be exorbitant. And maybe a third party here who is uh, very eager to use blockchain. Now I have very many good innovations, but I require internet connectivity. But internet is very expensive. So what do you do? We need, I think we really need to to look at how to reduce. And I know that a lot, of, a lot of work has been done to reduce the cost, but still high. When you, when you compare it to, to our peers in other regions, our internet costs are, are quite high. On average, let me say $35, I think, $35. That depends. So we really need to look at how, how, do, we, how do we come forward and, and, and uh, bring down the cost of the internet. It's very important. But also, Resilience is also key. Um, what do I mean? If the backbone from from Kenya, from the sea, Mombasa, Kenya, Uganda, gets a problem, you have redundancy from Tanzania or through Rwanda. Mass redundancy is very key because at the end of the day, technology must realize that technology things happen. Someone there can be a cut in the in the sea cable somewhere, and then get it out of blackout. You, you cannot afford afford such if we are to be really serious. So we must create redundancy, resilience across board, so that even if there are you know extraneous factors that happen where one link goes down, at least another link can still serve uh, serve the purpose. So investment infrastructure it can be it's capital intensive. Uh, that's why it requires a partnership really between the government and, and private entities. Yeah.